All right, so thank you for coming back. <laughs> um, I wonder, I think this is perhaps a good time to, to see if anyone has some comments or questions to ask or to share experiences. Um, hi, my question is just with regards to the, the um, template you gave to us, yeah. where um, <laughs> you kind of um, list each of those sections, what yeah. you took from. So um, when do you use those, those um, snippets that you, you put in those grades? Say, if I'm writing my literature review session, do I need to talk about the methodologies other people have used in the literature review session, or I use that area, the, lit the uh, methods in my methodology session, where I try to you know, show how, what people have done? Or do I speak about all those sessions in my literature review? So I just want to know where you use those um, snippet of those um, sessions. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, so um, one obvious way to use the method section from your review is when you argue that um, certain methods are used much more than others and that if you wanted to better understand the phenomena, maybe we need to use other methods. Um, you could also use that information if you are trying to um, claim that the method you're going to develop in your study is going to add contribution to body of knowledge. So again, just like the six doors that I showed you in the beginning, um, all those things can enter all different phases of the, um, of the document itself. So not everything that you review ends up in your theory chapter or your literature review chapter. Some will go to your introduction, some will go to your conclusion, some will go to your methods. They'll be uh, pretty much all over the place depending on the need. Um, where exactly they go, so if you look at the example here, the way that thing has been written there, um, this is where it goes because you're now presenting the general um, outcome of the review itself. But it's, so therefore it is important that, uh, it's important to note that uh, those elements in the first column of the template can change. So this is just like examples, but you could put pretty much anything there. And the reason why I use those examples is because if you look at any academic document, those elements are usually parts of the section. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Um, this normally takes one full day workshop. <laughs> so I'll try to uh, quickly summarize here. Um, actually, could I go back to one of the slides? I'll just do escape. No, I actually wanted to go to a different slide, a different uh, PowerPoint. Oh, will that confuse your recording? Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll just say it. Um, A concept and a model. Yes, let me, let me right. So let's start with concept. Concept is simply an idea, an idea that has standard ways of measuring. For example, rainfall is a concept, air is a concept, temperature is a concept. Why? Because there are specific ways of measuring that phenomenon. A phenomenon, right? Um, there, is, there is an idea, or there are ideas that cannot be measured directly. Ideas mostly in the social sciences. And those ideas are called constructs. And a construct is a crude concept. And an example of a construct, construct would be attitude. You cannot directly measure attitude. You need to reconceptualize the construct of attitude. So in attitudes, you can measure attitudes in terms of affect. Affect meaning feelings, emotions, and so on. Attitude can be measured in terms of cognition, thinking processes, 
attitude can be measured in terms of behavior, action. So you see that? So a concept is a primitive structure of knowledge, the foundation of knowledge. When you bring two concepts together and create some linkage, you're creating a framework. A framework is a body of knowledge, it's a structure that link concepts together. And that gives you the idea of conceptual framework, a collection of concepts that are related somewhat. You have to define the relationship based on some logic, some argument, or some theory. An example of a uh, conceptual framework, a simple example is hypothesis, unproven theory. You're saying A is related to B or A causes B. B will not happen, happen unless there's an A. And whether that logic is true could be uh, justified in terms of looking at the principles of causality, which is two things should be related before one could cause the other. And that the outcome should happen only after the cause has happened. So that's the logic or principle of causality. If some of you who are doing experimental studies, that's conceptual framework. Now, let's move to the other side. And that conceptual framework is a lower level of abstraction. When you look at theories that are related in terms of assumptions, in terms of purpose, in terms of phenomenon, you can create another structure that link them together. And that constitutes a theoretical framework. So a theoretical framework essentially uh, draws upon uh, different structures of concepts, different structures of conceptual framework to give you a theory. So theory is a higher level of abstraction. Model. Model, generally speaking, is an abstraction of reality. In other words, if I am a civil engineer and I want to build a bridge, or if I am an architect, I want to build a house, I have to do some drawing. That drawing itself gives me the reality, the abstraction of reality, a picture of that reality. So where does model fit within theoretical and conceptual? It is in between, could be developed in between, uh, conceptual framework and theoretical framework, depending, of course, on the discipline, depending on the purpose. And I'm going to make some declaration here, which I'm responsible, only me. <laughs> Every study has a conceptual framework, either explicitly or implicitly. It is there. Whether you call it that or you don't call it that, it is there. But not every study ends up with a theoretical framework. Although it is good practice to develop a theoretical framework from your literature review. What that means is that you have brought all these different writings about, um, about your topic and you develop a structure of knowledge that link them together, that has become a theoretical framework, or some framework of some sort. And within that framework, you can identify areas of interest, outstanding research questions. And once you have the outstanding research questions, and then you can develop studies that eventually you collect data and you can feed it back. So every study will have a conceptual framework some studies will have theoretical framework. You will not have a theoretical framework unless somewhat you have some conceptual framework. It depends on the discipline. If you're in the more um, um, quantitative, or you use a lot of quantitative uh, methods, hypothesis is almost there. Hypothesis is a conceptual framework that guides the researcher in collecting data. Does that make sense? So again, 
there are different views about it. We had, um, we get asked these questions a lot. So what we have done, we have done a systematic review of the literature on what people understand about the difference between these two, how they use it, and the conclusion was that there's no shared understanding. And that creates the confusion among students, create confusion among other academics. So we developed a workshop specifically to show the difference and similarities and examples of bad and good uh, conceptual and theoretical framework across disciplines. So it's not only one particular discipline that has misunderstanding. Why? Because these topics are within theory. And we know that theory in any area is very complex. OK, good question. We actually covered this topic briefly in the previous, uh, in the previous meeting. Any other comment? OK, so we perhaps go back to the idea of um, books, textbook versus journals, and so on. It is important to um, just a reminder that each and every discipline has a particular database where they draw um, literature from. So if you're working within um, health or you're working within psychology or other social sciences or business, there's usually a database that um, um, where you get most of your journals. Alsevier, Scopus, all those are different databases depending on your discipline. So generally speaking, um, you need to to be aware of what is considered high quality academic source. And of course, sometimes people refer to what they call gray literature. So gray literature is literature that has never been peer reviewed. Many years ago, I remember my friends from uh, history will never accept anything when you, uh, from uh, Wikipedia or blogs, opinion. Those are all gray areas because, I mean, they've never been peer reviewed, regardless of the quality. So it's important to, um, to be aware of that. Now, how do you structure or present the literature? It's a general, um, general practice where you start from broader perspective of writing the literature and then you narrow it down. So the idea is that you, uh, you explore different theories, different ideas, and then you narrow it to area of interest. You narrow it to the research questions. A good literature review document should identify outstanding research questions. A good Literature review should provide other individuals to learn about what needs to be addressed. And if you're able to critique the literature, and then you should be able to identify what you think should be done. It's a cumulative substance. Science is building on top of, you know. So technically speaking, there's no gap. Technical speaking, there is no research gap. And usually when I say that, my colleagues don't like it. <laughs> that I'm misinforming their students. I say, no, there is no research gap. Don't waste your time. And they say, what should I do? I say, go make up one. And when you make, a, make up one, you're actually justifying that this is an important thing to study. Because research gap is not something that you look for it and you get it. You have to claim it. You have to argue for it. If you say nothing has been done in this area, I say, so what? Who cares? But if you tell me that this is important, it has to be done because if it doesn't happen, this is going to happen. I say, oh, okay, okay, tell me more on then. So that's, you argue for a gap. You don't get a gap. 
you don't find a gap, you argue for one. If you're looking for a gap, you look it for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's on the extreme. Because then, um, people go and read and read and read and read, and then they are sent back to look for a gap. And then they read and read and read. They said, I didn't find a gap, because it wasn't there. You're actually told, educate yourself, think, synthesize, and reflect, and tell us what you think about the literature, and then ask questions, and then argue for the value of that question, and then sculpt that question. That becomes your gap. So finding gap is not easy, because you have to claim it. You have to convince your examiner. You have to convince the peer reviewer. We reject papers in journals. We review journals and we say, um, yeah, nice study, well done, well argued, well written, but doesn't add much because we already know it. No gap is clearly claimed. <laughs> All right, I think I'll stop here and see if people have questions. Yes. <laughs> nice. Prof, when it comes to, to sources, as a novice or an emerging researcher, I'm becoming skeptical when to come to textbook usage because most of the textbooks are outdated. Me, myself, I'm familiar with academic journals because they are more relevant and, and recent. When it comes to textbooks, majority of them are outdated. Mm -hmm. 1985, 54, you can name it. Yes, I mean, you're right. And just because they're old doesn't mean that they're not uh, useful because all things are very important. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're a historian, Right? If you're doing archival analysis or historical analysis, guess what? Your sources are old. Because that's, so what I'm trying to say is that depending on the domain. Um, textbooks in general take long. But remember, journals, some journals take one, three years. Actually, someone told me some time back that um, after three years, his paper was published. And he said, I don't know why. I said, yeah, because your discipline does not value journals. If you're a computer scientist, conferences, number one. Not all conferences, conferences within certain um, areas. So there's something called IEEE, Institute of Electronic, uh, Electrical and Electronic Engineers. They have their databases. Conferences within that are high quality, number one. And, and so their journals take long because nobody really cares. You know, this is just something to add to. So the new ideas are presented there. Um, but within, within um, textbooks, you have classical theories, right? So you might refer to them. But you're right. Uh, quite often, um, classical theories, uh, people don't dwell much unless there's a reason, and classical ideas published in textbooks. regards to the gray, gray um, literature. literature you were talking about. So um, in my own field, that's IT, most of what we do, you know, they are usually like um, new things because it's, it's still emerging. Mm -hmm. So, um, and most of the problems we have are usually social problems, not research problems. That is, it usually comes from, from um, the community or people's experience with using a system and things like that. So in that sense, you might, you might get more, most of what people would say would be say in a blog or say in, in a forum and things like that. How do you then, how do you reference those, those, um, reference, those sources? You, I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say because mm -hmm. now most yeah. people frown away, away from using Wikipedia and things like that. But that is where you find some of those social problems mm -hmm. in which you would now build on to, to, to get a research um, mm -hmm. problem. Or... Yeah, so, so it's important to, to always keep in mind that whenever you use citation, citation is used for a purpose. So what, what you're trying to do really here is that you're, you're trying to draw evidence, right? And so um, as opposed to uh, looking at someone's blog and identifying a research problem. Do you, do you see it there? 
utility of, of, of a blog. Of the source. Yes. yes, of the source. As a source. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how do you justify the credibility of a blog as a source? There, there are ways to reference it. Um, the, the challenge is that if, you, if your work is full of gray literature, and then you'll be critiqued, or that work will be challenged. Because those sources of knowledge were not subjected to peer review. Remember, the peer review, that's the golden standard in academia. So unless it has gone rigorous peer review, it will not have the same value. And so you might reference it, even thesis. Theses are not published in most cases, right? Some universities publish uh, theses as books, especially in Scandinavia and in some parts of Europe. Um, yes, you can refer to them, but the value is not the same as peer-reviewed journals or peer-reviewed book chapters or research books versus textbooks. So there's a hierarchy of those sources that are important when you actually engage in literature review and know when, how, and how to balance. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to share with you is organization of your literature. If you recall that, we start with framing a research area, right? When you frame your research area, you're more likely to have research questions. So you can write up the literature based on those questions. You can write up the literature based on the major issues and the minor issues. You can structure the literature in terms of what you think are the shared uh, perspectives in regards to the phenomena, what are the areas of disagreement. You can have a historical presentation. And actually, um, let's use an example. So in, uh, in computer science, right, there's something called reverse engineering, or maybe another, uh, what is reverse engineering? That concept itself. Right? You can do a literature review asking questions, what is reverse engineering? When did it first show up in the literature? Who proposed it? How has it changed? Is the notion of reverse engineering as years develop, change into many other things? What different tools were developed to support the idea of reverse engineering? So you can do chronological analysis of that simple idea to give you a broader lifespan, how that idea change. This will become um, useful if your topic is interdisciplinary. If your topic uh, has been researched to death, that's what we say, the topics that are researched to death. Motivation in education, right? Motivation is a very broad topic. A lot of people have written about motivation. Everybody thinks they know motivation, right? <laughs> but if you actually look at the history of motivation, you'll see that Scholars have said about it in different ways, in different contexts, in different disciplines. So we are recycling ideas, or actually this, uh, this idea of motivation has changed to other things. You can do that kind of analysis. That's what I, I call a chronological or historical development of concepts, and the variation, variation in terms of how they branch into other things. Here is the second template. And this one particularly will help you to think about how you synthesize the literature. Are there statisticians here? Statist- statisticians. Everyone use statistics, right? You don't have to be a statistician. Did you say that? No. <laughs> um, so the idea of... Um, Analysis of variance in statistics, right? So you have three or more groups, three groups. Let's say you have three groups. You wanted to say to see whether the, the three groups are comparable, they're equal or not. What essentially you want to do is to ensure that one group or each group has a very small degree of variation. So you minimize the degree of variation within a group 
and you maximize the degree of variation between the groups. The same logic in, in here, that you want to group certain theories with shared assumptions together so that you can compare and contrast the different theoretical underpinnings or meaning. And that is one way of synthesis. You could use methods of inquiry as a way of grouping theories. You could use time. You could use discipline. You could use the use of theory, the use of concepts. All those are different ways of synthesizing your literature. And what you do here, really, you're looking at shared uh, or summary, what each group, what are the general outcome of those articles within one group. You look at shared um, conclusion within the group. And then you look at areas where there are contradictions. And then you identify outstanding debates. And outstanding debates should help you to identify or to develop further research questions. So the question was, how would someone undertake a chronological analysis of a phenomenon that is quite recent? The uh, straight response is probably you could do it, but it might not be useful, right? So you need at least, um, that's why I use example of motivation, because motivation theories or motivations goes long, long time back. But um, if, you, if, you, if there's something called big data, Right? Big data, actually, the first time that word appeared was in 1992 or 90-something. So there's still some history there, but not as much as motivation. That probably goes to, I don't know, <laughs> 1800, maybe before that. So ideally, you only do chronological analysis on a phenomena that has been existed in existence for a long time, that has been researched from different areas, that might not necessarily be looked upon or understood in the same way. And motivation is one of them. Attitudes is another simple, um, uh, quite common area. Um, power, political science, power, authority, legitimacy, right? These three concepts are related. You may have power. You may not have authority. You may not have the legitimacy to execute that power. You may have power, you may have legitimacy, and you might have authority. You may have power, legitimacy, but you may not have authority. <laughs> right. So these are, uh, I mean, we're now moving to the world of political science and politics, where dictators, <laughs> dictators have power. They also have authority, but they may not be legitimate. <laughs> In the face of the people, I'm being recorded, so I better be careful. <laughs> But that's an example of those concepts that have been used um, back in the time of uh, Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, where power became a core concept. Distribution of resources, conflict, bureaucracies, proletariats, bourgeoisie, and all those things, right? So you look, that's history. So when you look at all these things, you'll start questioning, have those actually changed over the years? Have they? Do we use them the same? We still have dictators. Do they have power? Do they have authority? Is it the same? Is it relative? So if you're a political scientist, you may have those chronological analysis. Absolutely. So you have to log into classical theories. You have to, well, some of those, are, if you're using Karl Marx, they are probably translated from Germany. If you're using Max Weber, if you're using um, Herbert Spencer from uh, sociology, they have work that are written and translated by subsequent scholars. 
And we know that things that are, the things that are translated can lose meaning along the way. So if you're a political historian, you might be doing that. Okay, so um, the next thing is actually what do you critique? So there are many things that you can critique. One, as I said in the beginning, arguments. And how do you critique arguments? Any, anyone with, uh, can give us an example of an argument that can be critiqued? Can you critique a hypothesis? Is hypothesis an argument? So I hear voices. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most difficult things um, that most postgraduate students face is actually coming up with argument. They're told, you know, um, you should make an argument. So what is an argument? It's a, st a statement that makes sense or doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? So you can critique an argument. You can critique the way the argument is presented. And there's that word that I can't pronounce, so I'm going to leave it to you to read. Rhetoric, <laughs> right? So how is it presented? So that's more, more, um, more within uh, the linguistic presentation. Are there people doing law here? There you go. You do that quite a lot. <laughs> law people uh, critique uh, logic in order to convince uh, or to, I don't know what lawyers do. <laughs> methods, methods of inquiry, right? So you could also critique, you could say, a lot of this work has been done using quantitative, but this phenomena itself actually is more complex. And therefore, if you use this alternative method, you might get a different outcome. Theories could be critiqued. Marshall theory of hierarchy of needs. Do you think that applies to everyone? But that's when theories are actually abstractions that help us to understand reality because you cannot literally plug a theory and put it somewhere. It might not apply. So there are exceptions. So once you're able to identify those exceptions, that becomes your ability to critique. And Marshall theory was developed when? Is it historical analysis? When was it? Or maybe I shouldn't ask you because maybe you're not, uh, that's not your area of. Does, does someone know when that theory was developed? When did it first appear? <laughs> does anyone know uh, the, the hierarchies? All those things that the more you go and then. You don't want anything, you're always interested in something else. But that's perhaps simplification of human behavior. Have you seen uh, rich people throwing money down? Because they don't need it anymore? <laughs> you always collect it, right? <laughs> so is that need satisfied? <laughs> in economics, cannot be satisfied. The theories of um, marginal return in economics. If I starve myself for days, the first, or if I keep myself um, dehydrated for a number of hours, not days because I'll die, <laughs> the first sip of water I get gives me maximum satisfaction. And then the second one gives me another satisfaction until it decreases. That's that theory says that. But the exception, there are certain things in life that the more you have it, the more you need. <laughs> right? So that theory of economics fails to explain um, that actually exceptions are there, except economists like to say, ceteris paribus, keeping other things constant. Right? So let's play around. <laughs> um, so you could critique theories along those ideas or critique um, ideas along um, those lines. 
We can critique stability. How stable is someone's conclusion? And stability also could be in terms of time. Um, we, can we can critique established beliefs, and um, normally when you go there, you're really becoming creative and innovative. What is an example there? Cryptocurrency. Facebook is coming up with a currency called Libra, right? Established beliefs is that you have to have dollar or run in your pocket. <laughs> now they're going to say you have to have apps and buy things, right? So that itself, a departure from a norm. What works in South Africa might not work in Zimbabwe, might not work in South Sudan, might not work in Algeria, and so on. So context becomes very important. You could say this research is applied here, but it will not apply there because of all these other uh, variables that you have to take into account. So you can critique work based on that. Different models. So there's that saying that uh, one size fits all, right? Doesn't work everywhere like that. So that's the critique there. OK, so these are examples of what you can critique. By the way, there is, um, with the slides, there's a book chapter. It's also part of the, so you can distribute that with it, with some concrete examples. Now, here are things to avoid when you write the literature. These are called logical fallacies. We understand that people are passionate about their topics. We understand that these topics really means a lot to the individuals. But sometimes, some people actually would not have that same level of you know, interest, right? So be modest, don't exaggerate. So that's called appeal to exaggerated research gap. And there are a lot of them actually can read literature, well-published papers. For the last 10 years, we know this and this. However, this has never been done. And then the research goes on to say how they have done it. So there's little said about why this was not done in the first place. Appeal to volume. Just because you have 150 citations doesn't make your literature review credible. <laughs> Remember. Each citation is a source of data. So if you're using something that is irrelevant, right? Appeal to history. Just because it has been you know, done that way doesn't mean that it cannot be changed. Appeal to emotions. Just because English is not my first language doesn't mean I can write an article making grammatical errors and submit and reviewers should accept it, <laughs> right? But you see, these are different kinds of uh, emotions that, as a writer, you know, an academic writing, you should try to minimize. Example here is when you see, for instance, someone saying, according to minister of something, or according to professor of something, according to doctor of something, this is true, right? We can critique the ideas of the professor. We can critique the ideas of the minister. We are not critiquing the minister, we are critiquing the ideas. That's how we develop new knowledge. So just because the person that occupies that position has said something, technically speaking, it does not make it right. It could be critiqued. So this can become a little bit controversial, and that's why academic work can be controversial, right? <laughs> Okay, so the last part here is really how do you know whether your literature actually makes sense? A simple indicator is to be organized. Another indicator is to look at the structure, the sequence, the logic, how you present it. Another indicator is, of course, to be critical. You don't sit on the fence. You take, you take um, a position. You have to be decisive. 
and the literature has to be conclusive. That means that you conclude that this area has been researched this way and these are the outstanding research questions. And then the last one is, your literature should open debate or open can of worms. <laughs> So these are some of the indicators that you could use to look at um, the quality of the work. Otherwise, I think those are some of the things I want to share with you. And I don't know if questions, comments. Yes. Does policies or legal frameworks form part and parcel of literature review? Can policies or legal frameworks form a part and parcel of literature review? Can policies form part of literature review? Yes. Yes. Um, and this really falls within a different category of research. So policy analysis or general content analysis. But if you're saying uh, using policy documents to be part of literature review, all right, yes, but remember policies are also gray, uh, gray literature. They're not peer reviewed. You can use them, but not overuse them. These are documents written by people. Sometimes policies are not uh, based on scientific work. Policies can be political, right? <laughs> So they're not really vested, or, or in other words, um, critique. So um, the gray area um, literatures, like the policies, um, I remember I was told that you could use them when you're stating facts, say, say statistical facts in a country and things like that, because that is what that is where those facts are being presented, and yep. you might only find them there and not in in a research. So, and then um, one other idea with regards to literature that I was taught then, and which I I use is when I want to start my literature, I always look for um, journals, literature literature rev critical literature review journals in my area. So you know there are literature review papers. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. I do. Yeah, so I, I look through all those literature review papers in that area and then I use it to kind of um, draw out keywords, areas in which people have spoken about because they give a very detailed literature of what has happened in that domain. So I use it as a, as, as a stepping stone and I also use it to identify um, journal papers or mm -hmm. publications that I can also read up on in order to extend my own um, readings. Yes, and, and I think, um, as you said, um, policies could be cited. They could be partly facts, but they, the truth is that um, they could also be contested. And, and overdrawing from policy makes your work too political. <laughs> I guess, um, but, but so that's one. Um, depending on the context, depending on what subject you're studying, if you're studying education and the policies on education by the ministry, you can certainly say according to this policy, something developed, uh, this is what it is. Um, in terms of critical reviews, each and every discipline has journals that publishes those critical reviews. And critical reviews can be opinionated, opinion piece, and they're quite often, um, um, they're also peer reviewed um, and they're quite often um, uh, mostly theoretical or based on some practical um, uh, uh, issues. And, and so it really depends on the context, depends on the subject that you're, you're, um, you're studying. But policies in general um, uh, within the category of gray literature because they're not being peer reviewed. Sure. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe this is a very stupid question, but... Um, there is no such thing. <laughs> yeah, but um, I'll always expect um, a good answer. Um, <laughs> very good. 
Um, with the theories, um, is, it a, is it a must that your paper or your research should have a theory or theories yeah. or connected theories? If you can't find one, um, can it be dismissed as um, non-scholastic writing or you can still be accepted? Yeah, so any piece of academic work has to have some theoretical underpinning. Now, when you say theoretical underpinning, we're referring to um, general the literature, any body of knowledge, anything written about that particular or known about that particular phenomena. But there are circumstances where we actually refer to particular theories, particular bodies of knowledge. Now, because that's the norm, that's what makes academic work different from other work, it has to be there. So it doesn't matter it's, uh, master's or postgraduate diploma or PhD, it has to have a theory as the foundation of inquiry. Now, how much theories goes into master's and how much goes into PhD? That depends on the topic, depends on discipline, depends on many other things. Every database is theory. <laughs> I think the, 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 um, the challenge here is the difference between theory and literature. A theory is a body of knowledge, and so is the literature. A specific body of knowledge can be called theory. There are grand theories, there are micro theories, there are mega theories, there are middle range theories, there are all kinds of theories. Every discipline has their own theories. Osmosis, right? Osmosis in biology, this is a theory, right? Gravity could be a theory. There will be a lot of work written about gravity. Consumers' behavior, there are a lot of theories around that. Innovation, technology adoption, there are a lot of theories around there. So within a theory, you'll, you'll see a vast amount of literature generated within that. So that's why I'm saying, formally speaking, a theory is a body of knowledge with a certain assumptions, certain structures. Informally speaking, literature review or literature is a theory. So you, you find theories in databases, yes, because databases are made of theories. <laughs> saying you've identified a research topic and you find it interesting and your supervisor approved the topic mm -hmm. but when you come to literature review you find out there's there's nothing much there's no literature or the literature it's 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 not academic what what do you do in in that case mm. there's there isn't much literature on on your chosen topic that's a good question and quite often uh, there are two possibilities there. If there's nothing written much about the topic, and then you're lucky. Because <laughs> that's an opportunity, right? Because you're the first now, that's your opportunity. Now, the second possibility is that, are you sure there's nothing written about it? Are you looking in the right place? Are you using the right keywords? Do you have a strong search strategy? I can guarantee you that most of the time, someone somewhere has written something, even if not directly, but related to that topic. And you can always draw from that. Maybe the, 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 the literature there is, the, is not academic. It's like your, your, the magazines, the brochures from government departments, because they are not like um, academic papers because I once had um, a, a, a problem like that where the, pro the, um, the topic was approved by the supervisor. It was around the CITAS in South Africa. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but when you go deep into it, th there's, there's, there's nothing much. It's all about the, 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 what the magazines, the brochures from government, the reports, the reports from the government, how much they've spent how many programs they've implemented, but it's, 
it's not empirical. Yeah, so in that case, you can develop your research problem based on those magazines, and then you can go to another discipline to borrow ideas and try to relate. So that's the idea of interdisciplinary, because sometimes we have to cross to other disciplines to borrow ideas to help us. <laughs> but there's always there is a high probability that someone somewhere did something. So you have to make sure that you're looking in the right place or using the right frame. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, Prof. Thanks, Prof. I think mine is a follow-up question from uh, my colleague. Uh, I think when you, when you first uh, draft your sort of um, research question, you are put into a certain discipline. Now, when you find, when you go deeper into literature, you find that your literature, for example, I'll make a, a, an example with, with my research topic. It's, it's within supply chain in government, but supply chain is also a, a business concept, if I may put it that way. So when you go deeper into your <clears throat> literature or your research, you are finding it, you've got rich data on the on the business side of things as opposed to government but your topic and you've been placed under the discipline which is public administration mm -hmm. but your literature is leaning you towards this side which is not where you are rightly placed based on your topic so how then do you go forward do you go for that dry data or you go for the data which you feel would will strengthen your topic which is this side so I think that's a, a dilemma that I'm faced with, mm -hmm. uh, to say how then do you progress forward within that? Yeah, Yeah. so I see, I see the, the dilemma there, the challenge there, but again, you can turn that into opportunity. Because why I say that, you could, this would be one of the critique, critique of context, for instance, where a lot has been known about supply chain within the business. However, little, has been done within government context. And it is important for us, therefore, to look at how supply chain within the government context can add value. And so my research will look into those questions. So you'll draw ideas from the business world and try to help those, put them together to help you channel the questions, channel the strategies, channel the methods, channel the... Um, uh, the concepts to develop that area of supply chain within the government. Yes. Now, I, I, I think when all of this started, I was assigned a supervisor who is more leaning towards this side. There is a supply chain management discipline, and then there's a public ad administration uh, discipline. So my supervisor is on the public administration discipline. So now going forward, is my supervisor sort of the right person to be supervising me now that my, 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 my topic is sort of shifting shape as, as I progress forward? Yeah, so um, the question now um, is really on supervision. And again, different institutions have different policies. And I'll draw in our university, Sometimes students are supervised by individuals who might not necessarily be directly working in that area, but they offer some kind of um, expertise. And that's why sometimes you have two supervisors. So one will be from another department to supplement or complement some of the missing. Um, now, whether that person is the right person, well, that really I can't say. <laughs> that depends on how supervision is structured within the department, and what expertise you have. Or maybe that individual is the only expert uh, or close you can get. So what do you do then that both of you work together, and guess what, we all learn from each other sometimes. Um, so it is still doable, as long as there's good relationship and good understanding. Yes, Prof, you have spoken of organization of the literature. In my college or College of Law and Management, I have seen two types of literature. 
most of them are based on research questions. Some are character, like robot taxi, continental, and local. What are the other types that you know? So what was the question? What are the types of literature? Structure. Structures. Structures. Right. So there are, yeah, you're right. There are different ways of um, uh, organizing literature. Some of them um, are fairly descriptive. Some of them um, are relational. Some of them are what we call integrated literatures. Some of them are what we call systematic reviews. And even within the systematic reviews, you have different bodies. You have the Cochrane, for instance, Prisma, for instance, um, you have meta-analysis. Those are different ways of, you know, um, organizing the literature. So there are certainly ways, um, um, uh, different, uh, different researchers, different disciplines. If you're in the health sciences, perhaps, and business, they prefer certain ways in which the literature should be organized. And also there's supervisory preferences. Some supervisors might prefer you to be more thorough, <laughs> others will say, um, don't do too much, just do this. <laughs> so um, I guess that relates back to what I try to do in providing those methods and strategies is that I provide the tools and it's up to individuals to use them the way it fits. Um, but it's important to understand what is the norm in your discipline and what are the expectations of the supervisor. And if you're an academic, what are the expectations of your journal editor? Because um, some papers go to the editor first before they're sent out for, um, for review. Yes, there are many ways of um, structuring the literature. Oh, uh, prof, uh, my question here is, uh, there's a, way, a point where you said that uh, from your literature review, basically, you draw your outstanding research questions. Uh, my understanding, I just want to know whether uh, I'm on the right track. My understanding uh, is that, uh, okay, you would have research questions and then uh, your, your, lit your literature review, you base them on those uh, research questions. So uh, if you could uh, provide some clarity or do you have, have two uh, reviewing a theory one way you want to derive your research question and then uh, do you also have a do you have to have a second uh, literature review basically where you specifically uh, uh, talk to your research questions yeah yeah so good question um, I think I think um, the most important question is really to ask where do research questions come from Right? So research questions might come from application experience, and then you can go to the literature to see how, whether the similar questions have been answered. And if they have, un they have been answered, in what way have they been answered? Are they satisfactory answered or not? And that's when you claim for your gap, right? Sometimes people might not have clear research questions, so they read and read and read and read, and research questions emerge from their reading. And when that happens, Chances are that you authentically develop those questions from something that is really missing in the literature. Of course, depending on um, how, you, how you engage with the literature. And so, um, yes, you can have research questions and engage with the literature to clarify the research questions and then to develop those research questions um, and then develop ways to answer those questions. Or you could start with the literature and then develop research questions there and then go back to see how you can argue for that gap and then execute the study. So it can go both ways. From my experience, I was being told that you know, all areas of your sessions of your thesis or paper, they are all linked, like there's a linkage between everything. So I'm trying to, from what I know is that the literature review, um, you kind of structure it's based on, you use your, your conceptual framework or whatever framework you are using to structure your literature. 
so that it's easy for you when you are also discussing because you also have to link that literature with your discussion and things like that so is it is 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 that a norm is that what you should do or um it's just one way you know where you have to to specifically structure it based on say different constructs that are in your conceptual framework yeah so again um the question is whether we should have conceptual framework and how you, you go about using that in your discussion. Now, of course, as I said in the beginning, that certain disciplines is almost always possible to identify conceptual frameworks. And those disciplines, especially more empirical quantitative, where they start with hypothesis, right? Um, and in certain disciplines, those are not quite obvious. If you're doing qualitative study, because qualitative study do not have, um, not every qualitative study has uh, a solid research question. Sometimes they have goals because research questions develop. Now the assumptions there, whether they're explicit or implicit, could be regarded as conceptual framework. Now they don't have to be presented as diagrams. Conceptual framework could be presented as tables or written statements and assumptions. Diagrams are often used because they offer better clarity of relationship. Now again, depending on what you are studying, depending on your discipline, depending on the expectations of your committee, because there are also other expectations, and some of them, um, some of this would, would, um, would direct you where you need to go and how you need to go about what you're trying to do. All right, I think we've reached sort of the end of the session. Um, it really is uh, for me a pleasure to thank you all for your participation, for your attendance. I hope that you've taken something away. Very often from these sessions, it might be just one thing and it can change your, your thesis and your work hugely. So it doesn't have to be a whole lot of things. It might just be one or two really, really special things. I do want to remind you that these slides and the, and the chapter from the book will be available uh, for, for, to, to, for distribution. If you put your name on the attendance register, we'll use that to send to you. Um, so please make sure that you've popped your name onto one of the attendance registers somewhere or the other. Um, I wanted to thank Prof. Ben, and, and with all these things, you always say, well, what do we take away? So I, this is what I take away, just for what it's worth. Uh, the first thing was this notion of the literature review in several places. I, I like that emphasis, that it's kind of everywhere and nowhere all at the same time, but everywhere probably more than, more than not. Um, I like the systematic emphasis. So I think if you've got a plan and you follow a plan, it makes it a lot easier. Many researchers start and you start somewhere and you meander and you can spend many years meandering. So if you've got a systematic plan, I think that's very, very helpful. Um, I like what he said as well about having a voice in the literature review and that you don't want to be an echo. Very, very powerful idea. I think we all, it's so much easier to just echo, but that you really want to get to your voice coming through quite clearly. Second to last thing, I promise you, efficiency man i wish there was a way to learn that quickly unfortunately you've got to kind of find your own way a little bit but try to make it efficient because otherwise you really do waste a lot of time i'm terrible because i get interested in all those little things on the edge and then i'm gonna wander off and so it's very very difficult the efficiency is very important and the last thing i loved was the notion that you create a gap. You don't go walking into the literature and a gap appears. It never happens that way. So a lovely yeah, emphasis. Right. Prof Ben, thank you for sharing with us. We thank really you. appreciate what you've done. We look forward to, to what you're going to do tomorrow. So this is just a little reminder. Tomorrow we're gonna to be looking more broadly at qualitative research, quantitative research, maybe a little bit on mixed methods, and everything in between all of those things. Tomorrow's session will be, will be think more amenable to a workshop format because we're going to be remember in the GSB auditorium and I sincerely hope I'm going to see all of you there tomorrow starting 8 30. Okay thanks for attending go well thank see you. you tomorrow. <laughs> thank, you, thank you thank you thank you.